morning, and I'll explain that why in a minute. But before I do, I don't want to let anyone down that's been coming to Arise for a number of years. Um, I look forward to uh, Easter Sunday for many reasons, but number one is because every year I get to tell my favourite, favourite joke. So I'm going to tell you my favourite, favourite joke. You're going to have to wait another 52 weeks to hear it again, so if you really think it's a cracker, lock it in your diary, 2023, arise Easter Sunday morning, and here it is. A man, his wife and his cranky mother-in-law, I know I could get shot down for that, I'm just going to preface right now, maybe a little politically incorrect, I'm sorry, don't cancel me. A man, his wife and his cranky mother-in-law went on vacation to the Holy Land. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000 or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for 150 bucks." The man thought about it for a while and told the undertaker he'd just have her shipped home. The undertaker was totally complex. He said, why? Why would you spend 5000 to ship your mother-in-law home when it would be wonderful to be buried here in the Holy Land for only 150 bucks?" The man said, here's the, re- here's the reality. A man died here about 2,000 years ago. He was buried here, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take that chance. <laughs> it's still funny, isn't it? It doesn't matter how many years in a row I say it, it's still a cracker of a joke. Here's something that's not really funny, but at the same time kind of funny. I found it kind of funny. I was just reading uh, the other day that... Um, there was a recent survey done of atheists. Now, everyone knows what an atheist is. To, to, to say you're an atheist is a, is a definite statement. In other words, to say I'm an atheist means that I know, I, I have information, I know that there's no such thing as a God. Now, in my personal opinion, there's no such thing as an atheist because no one can definitively state there is no such thing as God. And so here's what I do, just a side issue, I digress for a second. Anyone tells me they're an atheist, I'll put it this way. Um, how much information do you think you know about everything there is to know about everything there is to know? And maybe the smartest of people might say, look, I know 5% of all information out there about everything there is to know about everything there is to know. And then I'll say to them, well, is it possible in the 95% of information you have not come across yet that there could be evidence to prove that there is a God that exists? And I've never had anybody say to me, no, it's impossible that in the 95% of information I don't know. So straight away, I just want to put that out there. I don't believe in atheists. But there was a survey was done just recently uh, about uh, uh, atheists. And here's what they found out in a recent survey. 19% of atheists were angry at God. <laughs> don't know why I wanted to share that. I just did. I just thought that was almost as funny as the gag I told you before. So 90% of atheists were angry at God. So they're angry at what they don't believe in. It's like, I guess, when we just went through COVID, people that didn't believe in COVID but didn't want you to get close enough to them because they didn't want to catch it. But you don't believe in it, but you don't want to catch what you don't believe in. Anyway, turn to Romans chapter 6 for me. We'll get into something that makes sense. Romans chapter 6. Hey, when Paul wrote this, this, this book of Romans, how many of you know that, that when the writers of these ancient documents wrote them, they, probably not in their wildest dreams, ever envisioned that they would be the authors of the biggest selling book of all time. Ever thought about that? These guys were writing uh, uh, from prisons and from dungeons and from the wilderness and caves and, and, and palaces and all kinds of different places. Over a time span of around 1,500 years, 66 ancient documents were written. All, all it turns out, pointing in the same direction all talking about the same thing, God's redemptive plan for mankind. What we call the Old Testament, all pointing forward to this moment in human history that we now know as the cross, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And the entire New Testament, most of it, pointing back to that moment as well uh, of what happened with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But when, when, when these guys were writing this, they never envisioned that it would become a, a chapter or a volume in the biggest selling book of all time. They weren't writing to try to get a bestseller. They weren't writing to try to, to, to probably even spur on a worldwide movement. They were writing to a, in, in, the, in the particular case of Romans, Paul's just writing to the, 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 the churches in Rome and nobody really knows whether it was a big gathering or whether it was about five or six little house churches. They don't have any definitive answer. It seems like there might have been smaller gatherings. But Paul's writing this letter so they can go to the gatherings and stand there and read this letter to the people in the gathering. So I don't ever want anyone here to ever complain if I preach for 40 minutes. Next time you do, I'll stand there and read the whole book of Romans and let's see how you like that. Because that's what these guys would have been doing. They would have been sitting there while they're reading out this whole thing, you know. So these guys were not 
writing these with the expectation that in 2022 that we would be sitting here in Ganelaba with a lovely leather-bound copy of them all together, uh, probably 12 or 15 of them in our house collecting dust on shelves everywhere. They weren't writing for that. Paul's writing in the book of Romans and he's just giving what, what most theologians would say is, is, is probably the, the, the best understanding of who God is, who we are, how God sees us, how we should respond to God, and the whole Christian story and what it means for mankind. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul writes this. He says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Speaking of Jesus. We were buried with Jesus through uh, baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I, I love Paul's confidence when he writes this. He says that, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, he's very confident about this fact, isn't he? He's not saying just as I think, or just as maybe, or just as the people are saying, just as the rumor's getting around. He's just saying matter-of-factly, just as Jesus was raised from the dead. He had a strong, purpose-filled conviction that Christ was raised from the dead. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 8, here's what Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What I received, he's talking about the message that he heard. And I don't want to go into it, but if you go back into Galatians, he tells you that he received this message directly from God. This wasn't something where he sat down with the other apostles and disciples and said, tell me the story. He had his own encounter with God. Anyone knows Paul? He used to be a guy called Saul who used to hate God, hate the church, and did everything he could to make sure that the church didn't get off the ground. Um, but, you know, you, you can't stop God. You just can't stop God. That is, by nature, I guess, part of what makes him God. He's kind of unstoppable. Kind of unstoppable, isn't he? And he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And here's what he received. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So according to the ancient writings. So Paul didn't have a New Testament like we do, but he had the Old Testament. And a lot of those writers, hundreds of years before Jesus ever came, wrote things speaking into the future about a time where God was going to come and he was going to set people free and he was going to liberate mankind. And so Paul says that Jesus rose from the Jesus was crucified for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I love it. He's so confident, isn't he? He's just so confident about this resurrection thing. And then he goes on and he says this. He says that uh, and then after he resurrected in verse 5, it says, And he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. That's really interesting because uh, he must have been so confident about it that he didn't mind at the time. So to us, it's a letter. We read it about something hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. But the audience that are reading it are going, okay, so you're telling us this. You're telling us that he also appeared to 500 people, and those 500 people, most of them are still alive today. I could quite easily, if I wanted to, go and verify something like that, couldn't I? If I wanted to, I could quite easily uh, uh, go, okay, well, if they're still around, where are they? I don't think Paul was lying. I think Paul was telling and speaking about what he was so incredibly confident was actually true. This, this happened, and I don't mind giving you the facts. He appeared to him, appeared to him. Most of the guys I'm talking to you about are still alive. You can go and ask them yourself, and they'll verify exactly what I'm saying. Jesus Christ is resurrected, and he is alive. It's a risky call if it's not true. But as far as Paul's concerned, hey, it's true. Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And he continues on. He says, though some of them have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James. He appeared to, to, to James, to Jesus' brother. Remember Jesus' brother? Throughout the, the, the gospel story there, he wasn't a believer. He didn't believe that his brother was the son of God. And I get that. If my brother came to me and said he was the son of God, I'd have a few questions and checks about it too. You know? Who do you think you are, the son of God? Well, actually, funny you should bring that up. I'd be mean to have a chat with you. I don't know how it would have went down, but it would have been weird, wouldn't it? Hey, probably would have been weird too, being compared to him. Like, like I wonder if, if Mary ever compared to, you know, James to Jesus. Why can't you keep your room clean like Jesus? Well, he just goes like that, and bang, everything's in place. It's a little bit different, but I'm sure he didn't. By the way, he would have cleaned his room like everybody else. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. 
He mentions the 12. He says that he appeared to the 12 disciples. If anyone knows a bit about church history, most of those guys went on and church history will tell you they were crucified for their belief in the resurrection. That is a pretty, pretty powerful lie if it's not true. It costs a lot if it's not true. If Jesus was not resurrected and these initial witnesses didn't, didn't actually see that, think about it. What, what kind of a, is there a lie that you could tell that you'd be prepared to die for? I can't think of one. I cannot think of a lie where I would physically give my life to cover my tracks and make sure everybody believed that lie. At some point, I'm going to crack. I was reading recently the, the testimony of, um, anyone know Chuck Colson, Charles Colson? Yep, yep, involved in the Watergate scandal in the 70s in the US with President Nixon, and he was one of the guys that went to prison um, for what happened there. And, and here's what he said. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. See, normally on Easter Sunday, here's what I would do, is I would take some of that stuff and I would talk to you about some of the evidence for the resurrection. Because here's the thing. Hebrews 11 tells us that, 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 faith, that our faith has substance, doesn't it? Hey? He, Hebrews 11 tells us that, 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 that faith is substance, that there's evidence to faith. So the Christian faith is not just a blind leap into the great vast nothingness of religion. There, there, are, there are verifiable things about, that make the Christian religion make incredible sense. And, and, and normally what I would do on a day like today is I would unpack some of that stuff and point you in some directions so that you can have a look at the, the, the reality of the resurrection and why is it a viable thing to believe in. Because on the surface, it sounds crazy. On the surface, it sounds as ludicrous as me saying Steve Jobs is raised from the dead. On the surface, it sounds as ludicrous as me saying Elvis Presley is raised from the dead. Unless we're talking about God. Unless Jesus is everything he said he was. And by the way, if Jesus Christ was the Son of God, if he did die, if he was buried, and if he did raise from the dead, let me encourage everybody in this room that follows him, if he actually was able to predict his own death and resurrection and then pull it off, then you should take seriously every other word that he had to say. Anyone that can predict their own death, burial, resurrection and pull it off. I'm listening to every word from that moment on. It's why we take the words of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus seriously as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus. So normally on Easter, I'd, I'd look for all these evidences and point you to them. The original witnesses. If you go back and you have a look at the original witnesses to the resurrection, who were they? The women, weren't they? Well, if you're back in that culture in that day and you're trying to start a lie that's going to go throughout the ages and get traction, then you find credible witnesses. You don't, you don't, you don't say women were the first people to see them, not in that culture in that particular time. Women were not considered credible witnesses back then. Yet all four gospel writers say the first people to see the resurrected Jesus were women. Now, if you're making up a story that you want to get traction, hey, you know, the first person to see Jesus resurrected was Owen Allsop. And everyone goes, oh, it was Owen, it must be true. <laughs> Owen Allsop, a man of good standing. You know? If I said it was Rod, I... <laughs> Joking, Rod. Blame Theo. It would have been him, but he's not here. There was an ancient uh, uh, proverb that the Jews had, and it was this, better the law of the Lord burnt than delivered to a woman. That gives you a little bit of, uh, of understanding of their perspective of women when it came to these kinds of issues. It's not that women were mud and downtrodden, but they certainly were not respected enough in a court of law. And, and if you were to bring them as witnesses to a trial, that, that their witness would not be powerful. Their witness would be null and void. But yet, the first people to see Jesus are women. That's what these ancient writers tell us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they say it was women. Well, you don't use them kind of witnesses if you want traction for a lie. The only thing I can assume is that it was true. That's why they just simply told the truth and the truth would stand. What about their choice of place to begin spruiking this resurrection story? Why would you go back to Jerusalem to begin spruiking the resurrection? Of all the cities and towns in the known world they could have gone to, why go back to Jerusalem? The very one where if it was not true, that's the place where they would know about it. You don't go back into the lion's den. And that's what they did. They went straight back into Jerusalem and they began talking about this thing in Jerusalem. 
Now, if the Jews had the body, if the Romans had the body, if anybody knew there was a hole in that story, you know, it'd be a smart thing to do. If I was starting a lie, I'd go to the furthest away place that I could and I'd start it there and I'd drip feed it there and I'd get some following and then let it sort of drift in. And then by the time people in Jerusalem went, no, that's not true, they go, no, 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 that's, that is true. That's what we were but they went straight back into Jerusalem. Why would you do that? The only reason I can conclude they did that was because they didn't care, because it was true. They weren't trying to make something up and they weren't trying to hide something. I'd point to the existence of the church 2,000 years later. This tiny, illegal sect group. And that's what Christianity was in the beginning. It was an illegal sect group. Now look at us all over the world. People finding hope and life through Jesus. On every continent, every tribe, every nation, every tongue. If it was a lie, it was a really good one. (laughs) Because 2,000 years later, man, it's pumping and it's still going strong. So normally that's what I would do on Easter Sunday. I would take more time and unpack each of those things. And if any of that stuff's of interest to you, you can, you can find that information. Have a chat with me. I'll talk to you a bit more about some of that. But a funny thing happened on the way to church. I was reading that verse, and I felt like, and if you're not a believer here, um, I don't want to get wigged out by this. When, when us Christians say God spoke to us, you know, somebody said God spoke to us. And straight away you're thinking, you guys are nutcases. Like you're thinking you're hearing audible voices. No, I don't mean that. But here's the thing, I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, but also resurrected. I also believe that one of the things he said is, when I go to be with my Father, I'm going to send my Spirit to come and indwell you as believers. And so I have the Spirit of God. This is what I believe, according to what these ancient writers taught, and according to my own experience, I have the very Spirit of God inside of me. And God loves me, and God likes to talk to me. So when I say I heard from God, I'm not saying an audible, booming voice, just this general sense on the inside where I felt like God highlighted something different in that verse for me. And wanted me just to to throw a couple of thoughts at you this morning along this line. Now, we're going to do something here that we don't do every Sunday, and there's a reason for that, but we're going to do it today. At the end of our service this morning, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to open up the front, and we want to pray for people this morning. We want to pray for people. And... uh, So as I'm speaking, as I'm sharing these next few thoughts with you, I want you to listen to that little voice of the Spirit inside of you. Amen? I want you to listen to what the Lord might want to say to you, what he might want to show you about your world, about your life. And we would love to stand with you and pray with you for for anything you feel like God might bring up. And here's what I want to look at this morning. Same verse, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, so in other words, we were buried in order that. So, so, so we were buried with him for something to happen. Does that make sense? We're buried with him so that. We had to be buried with him so that something could happen. It's the something that could happen is the end game. That's what I'm wanting out of this whole thing. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying that we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We too, hands up if you're a we too. I'm a we too. When I read we too, I'm, I'm, I'm going, well, that's me. I'm a we too. I'm a we too. It doesn't mean like a little number two. It's just, I'm a we too. And the Bible says, whosoever, I go, I'm a whosoever. But in this situation, I'm a we too. We too may what? Live a what? A new life, that we too may live a new life. Anyone ever get anything that was new? Anyone ever get anything new? One person, no one's the only person in this whole building that's ever got anything new. At the end of the service, can you all go and ask, oh, what was that like? And maybe he can unpack what it felt like to get something new. Maybe he can tell you what the impact of something new had on his world. (laughs) New. He says, I don't want to recycle the old. I want to give you something new. I don't want to just recycle and refabricate and rehash what's always there. I want to give you something new, a new life. Jesus' death was about removing the barrier of sin, but his resurrection was about giving us a new life. Just as Christ was raised from the dead different, we are meant to be raised to new life that's different to the life we had before we came to Christ. Amen? Still thinking about it? That's okay. I believe it. I believe when I read these gospel accounts, I believe when I read the letters, I read that and I go, there's something in there that tells me that when Christ comes into my world, what what he offers me is something new. It's something different. It's transformative. God doesn't just want to come and manage my world. He wants to transform my world. 
He doesn't just want to manage, he wants to cure my ailments. And I'm not, just, I'm not talking, don't jump on all sickness, he said, no, I'm not saying, what I'm saying is the sin-sick soul and the impact of sin and wrong thinking and wrong living he's had on my life, he wants to cure me of that, unpack that, and bring me into a newness of life. So I can actually experience life, so I can actually live. Most people simply exist on this planet. We just exist. Remember the great, great story uh, uh, passage, John 10, 10. For the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, destroy. But I have come that you may have what? Life. Isn't it funny? How crazy of Jesus. He's talking to living people. Why would he say, I've come to give you life? They're sitting there with life. No, they're not. Because outside of Jesus, we don't really experience true life the way God intended life to be. God's definition of life is lived. It's like in the beginning. It was, it, was, it was God, man, and another. And that was life. It wasn't just some people think that, that, you know, it's just me and God. You know, ever hear people like that? I just, all I need is God. It's really interesting because the only time we have in the Bible and, and in human history that we know of where it was only God and man, God said, this isn't good. It's not good. Adam could have turned around and said, how can it get any better than this? It's just me and you, God. And God said, no, 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 it's not good. You need someone else. I need God and I need you. I need God and I need community. But Jesus is speaking to people who biologically have life, right? I've come that you may have life and have it in abundance. They've biologically got life. He's not talking about biological life. He's talking about a quality of life that comes to us when the Holy Spirit indwells us and when we surrender our, our lives to Jesus and we start actually taking seriously the call of God to live the way that he wants us to live. That's what Jesus is talking about. And I want to just throw a couple of thoughts at you over the next 10 minutes. What does a new life actually look like? What does a new life look like? So I just want to leave you with four things. Here are four new things that I think God offers us. And the resurrection, Paul's saying in Romans 6, the resurrection is evidence of the fact that just as Jesus was crucified, buried and raised anew, so too are we through faith. And here are four things that I think, uh, four new things that I think God offers us. Number one, God offers us a new start. Who's ever got to that point in their life where they just feel like, I, I need a new start? Anyone hear anyone say, so I'm going to leave town because I just need a fresh start? Yep, I've, I've, I've talked to many people over the years who will say, I'm going to change my location because I need a fresh start, a new start. I'm, I'm going to leave this church and go to another church because I need a new start. I'm going to quit that job and go to that job because I need a new start. I'm going to quit that marriage and... Marry someone else because I need a new start. I'm going to quit here because I need a new start. And the problem with the new start is this. You might go and find a new start, but you're still taking the same old person to the new place. Amen. The problem's not necessarily always out here. It's in here. It's me. I, I did a survey once. I sat down and I wrote out every bad situation in my entire life. Everything that's ever gone wrong for me has failed, has fallen flat and so on. You know what I found the one common denominator was in everything? Me! I was there in, on the page in the list. Everything that happened, I seemed to be there. It's crazy. I always thought it was my mother, but she was only there for about three of them. Or maybe it was my dad. Well, he was only there for about two of them. Maybe it was Jackie. She was only there for about 120 of them. Maybe it was Chloe. She was only there for about 300 of them. But I was there for every single one of them. I need a new start. Well, God offers us a new start. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, ooh, who's in anyone? That's another one of those all-encompassing words when you read it in the Bible. Anyone. Not just the smart ones. Not just the beautiful ones. Not just the multi-talented, skilled musicians like Daniel. Not just the ones that dress in finery. Not just the ones who drive a Beamer. Not just the ones with great physical build like, I don't know, you might be looking at somebody like that, but not just those types of people. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, watch this, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. If you're in Christ, guess what? You're a new creation. Did you know that? You are actually a new creation. God gave you a new start. When I was a kid, my father brought me a Triumph. Anyone remember the cars, the Triumph 2000? 
Remember them? Anyone remember an old Triumph 2000? You've you got to remember the Trumpy. Yep. Triumph 2000. Yep, there we go. My dad bought me a Triumph 2000 for $100. 100 bucks. And he did all the little tweaks and twinkles and things and got it going for a bit. And anyway, it lasted a year or so and then it died. So you know what he did? He went out and bought me another Triumph 2000 that cost another $100 and just gave me another one. That was a replacement of what I had, but it was just still something old for something old. What this verse actually means in the Greek, when it says that you're a new creation, it's not saying that, that he's taken what you are and done some work on it and souped it up. It literally, literally means a brand spanking new, never used before machine has been put in its place of the old one. That's what it means. You are literally a brand new creation in Jesus. The old, it says, has passed. It's gone. How many of us actually believe that? How many of us live like that? Or how many of us still feel like the residue of that clings to us? Or how many of us still hang on to the residue of that? Unable to let it go. He offers us a new start. Look at Zacchaeus. I love some of these stories in the Bible. Zacchaeus, this little dude that wants to see Jesus when he's coming through town. And Zacchaeus, it says, has to climb a tree because he can't see Jesus. It's really interesting, isn't it? Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because the people that were there to see Jesus wouldn't let him. It's kind of funny, that. I often think about that with church. Sometimes when, when people come, new people come into to church in Christian context, I go, are, are, are we making way for them to see Jesus or, 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 or do we get in the way from stopping them seeing Jesus because we're, I don't know, are really religious, too judgmental, too critical, too whatever. Do we stand in the way or do we actually give them a proper vision of Jesus? Do we help them see Jesus? He had to climb up a tree himself in order to see Jesus. But you know what happens? He sees Jesus, he comes down, he goes. Jesus has a meal at his house and without preaching, without anything, it's amazing. Zacchaeus comes to this conclusion, my goodness, isn't this Jesus dude awesome? And so he sits down, Jesus says, you know what, anything I've robbed off people, I've taken off them, I'm going to give it back to them well and above. And if you go and you you read that passage, Luke 19, and you uh, understand the context of the culture, he went way beyond what he was expected to do in terms of retribution and giving back. His life was transformed. He had a fresh start in that moment when he encountered Jesus. I don't know what he did from that point on, but what I do know is that when Jesus came to him, he offered him a fresh start, a new start. I wonder how many people would love a new start today. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, but guess what? You can still get to that point in your life where you go, you know, I need a new start again. I need a new start again. And that's what the resurrection of Jesus reminds us of, that newness of life means we can have a new start. What about the woman at the well? John, uh, was it John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And, and here she is outside uh, filling her buckets with water uh, in the middle of the day when it's hot. Why is she doing that? Because she can't do it with anybody else. Nobody will talk to her. She's kind of ostracized and outcast because she's got a bit of a background. We'll leave it at that. And Jesus comes and he encounters her. And after encountering Jesus, she runs into town. And here she says this statement to everybody. She says, man, come on out and see a guy who told me everything I've ever done. That's really interesting because the reason she was out there by herself was because everyone in town knew everything she'd ever done. That's why she's out there by herself, because they knew. Well, she comes along and goes, I met a guy that doesn't treat me like you. He knows everything I did, and he accepts me, and he loves me. Come and meet this dude. She got a fresh start. She got a new start that day. John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. Remember the story that men come along and... With this woman and say, here's a woman caught in adultery. There's no mention of where the man was. But I'm smart enough to know it takes two to tango. Here's a woman caught in adultery. And Jesus goes, draw it on the ground and so on and ends with that great line, you who have no sin, cast the first stone. And nobody can. They drop their stones and they all walk away. And Jesus turns to her and says, now, now go and sin no more. In other words, you've got a new start today. I'm giving you a new start. Do it different. Take hold of the new start, the new opportunity that I'm giving you from this moment on. Accept this new start, this offer for a new start. Second thing that a new life is, God offers us a new identity. He actually offers you a new identity. Did did, did you know that your identity... Identity is very topical today, isn't it? Everybody wants to identify with this group or identify with that group or identify with this. And I'm sort of tiptoeing on eggshells here because I don't want to get cancelled. 
but we're all trying to identify with something. and We're all trying to find our identity out there in some kind of place. But God changes our identity and God gives us identity. We find our identity in Jesus. God offers us a new identity. And it's not a bad identity, by the way. Here's a couple of the things that the Word of God tells me about my identity. I'm a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to sin. That's my identity. I'm not a, I'm not sin slave anymore. That's a part of my identity as this new creation. I've been made right in the sight of God. Not because I'm perfect, not because I'm great, but because of what Jesus did on the cross and my submission to Jesus. I'm made right in the sight of God. There's no condemnation for me anymore as I walk with the Holy Spirit and as I walk in the ways of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Whether you like it or not, I am. Not weirdfully and wonderfully, fearfully and wonderfully made. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, according to what Paul writes in the Every spiritual blessing, I've been blessed with it. I'm sitting here now, overflowing with spiritual blessing in my world. What you see there is just where I hold the spiritual blessing. That's what that is right there, okay? And thank you so much for not telling me I looked full of spiritual blessing in a red shirt on Friday. Went home and I saw the picture and went, oh my goodness, the spiritual blessing was overflowing. I have the mind of Christ. I'm filled with the very Spirit of God. My God provides all my needs. All my needs, not all my wants, but all my needs. I'm God's workmanship. I'm created by the hand of God, fashioned by the hand of God, and I've been created to do good things. That's just a little snippet of my identity. Now, my identity before I became a new creation was very different. My identity was tied up in the fact that I knew how to play football. Good. My identity was tied up in whoever the the pretty girl was that I was dating at the time. My identity might have been tied up in whatever job you had. Your identity might have been tied up with the group of friends that you hung out with, the cool cats or whatever. Your identity might have been found in all kinds of different things. But as a new creation, God offers us a new identity. You can keep your identity in all that stuff if you want, but one day all that stuff will change. Or you can accept the new identity I offer you as a child of God, knowing that that won't change. And my experience is the only place that doesn't shift, the only sand that doesn't roll around... When it comes to my identity, the only thing that I can place my feet on that gives me any sense of stability in my life is the identity that God gives me and what God says about me. Because God knows what you might say about me this week might change next week, eh? What you think of me this week might change next week. But God offers us a new identity. Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 Paul says this, he says, In the same way, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Now, if you go back and read all of that up until this point, here's what Paul's doing. He's writing, saying, this is is who God is, this is what God has done as a result of that, this is who you are. And then he gets to verse 6, 11, he says, Now, in light of everything I've just said, you've got to start to consider yourself and see yourself that way. You've got to start to see yourself as everything God says you are. Start seeing yourself the way God sees you. Stop waiting until you feel like it, because you'll probably never get there. Stop waiting until somebody else comes along and confirms. He goes, oh, you look like a child of God. It probably won't happen. This is what God has done, and God's reality is reality. Here's the new identity on offer. Accept the new identity and believe the new identity. You ever have people and you, you know them and you just see the, the gold in them? Anyone ever have people like that? And you just see the gold in them. You just know that they are great people. But you also get confused because you're pulling your hair out, those of you that have hair, pulling your hair out because you know that they don't see that. They think they're nothing. They think they've got nothing. They think they'll always be nothing. They think that there's no future for them. There's no hope for them. They think they have no value, no significance. They think their life has no meaning and no purpose. And you're looking at them going, man, you're the coolest guy I know. Everybody loves you. You're so so great at helping. When you talk, people listen. When when, when you sing, you've got the most amazing voice. People people gravitate to you. You, you, You've got so much wisdom in there. Let it out. And they're just sitting there going, no, I I don't see it. Sometimes I wonder, is that what you feel like with me, God? You say all these great things about me. You speak identity over me. You tell me who I am. And I'm the one going, oh, no, I don't feel like that, God. 
Oh, no, that's not me, Lord. That's somebody else. Oh, I, can believe, I can believe that for the person over here. I can believe that for Del. I can't really believe it for me, God. I wonder sometimes whether God has to put up with that from me because I just don't want to embrace and believe the new identity that he's given me and walk in it. But he offers me all these new things as a part of a new life. He offers me a new start. He offers me a new identity. Thirdly, he offers me a new power. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27 says this, speaking prophetically about what's going to happen down the track when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon people like you and me. He says, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from your heart of st- I'll remove from you your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. That's that heart transplant that God does when we surrender our life to him and he changes our heart. And then he says this, and I will put my spirit in you and move you. I'll move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. In other words, God didn't just give us a book and say, bang, now do your best and walk away. Like the toys you give your kids at Christmas and you forget to check the box where it says batteries included. Oh. And they unwrap it and they look at it and they love that toy. And then they press the start button, it doesn't light up and they realise there's no batteries and you didn't put them in. And then you're running around town on Christmas Day trying to find batteries and then you can't find batteries. So the batteries were included. What he's saying here is not only am I going to call you to walk and live a certain way, he says I'm going to infuse you with the power to do it. I'm going to put my spirit in you and my spirit is going to give you the momentum shift you need to want to move that way and to want to live that way. Christianity is not a self-help program, is it? Hey? It's not a self-help program. Like that movie, School for Scoundrels, I've mentioned a few times in the past. I'm not recommending the film. I'm just saying it's a great line. All these guys gather together for training. They're the kind of guys that have self-help books piled up on their bedsides. And this guy gets them all together in a room and he's going to give them, they think it's another self-help seminar. And he stands up and he says to them, he says, you know, I'll guarantee all you guys when you go home tonight, you've all got piles of self-help books on your bedside. And they're all going, yeah, yeah. And you've got self-help tapes and CDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, well, that's your biggest problem. You're trying to get help from yourself and yourself sucks. (laughs) Christianity is not a self-help program. I'm not trying to make myself holy and righteous. He's empowering me. He makes me righteous. He makes me holy. And he empowers me to live out who I already am, that new identity that he gives me. God gives us the power to live the way that he wants us to live. And finally... He gives us a new purpose. He gives us a new purpose. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The day I came to faith, my whole life took on a new purpose. From that moment on, I had a purpose. I floundered around not sure what my life was about. You know what my purpose is? My purpose is not to preach. That's just what I do as I outwork my purpose. But it's not my purpose. You know, pastoring is not my purpose. Being a pastor of a church is not my purpose. That's just what I outwork as I fulfill my purpose. I could be back at Dan Murphy's being a manager again at Dan Murphy's. I could be doing that and still be fulfilling my purpose. Because my purpose is outlined here. My purpose is that I should no longer live for myself but live for him. It doesn't matter about my vocation, my location. It doesn't matter what I'm doing with the hours of my day. It's am I doing it to glorify him? Am I doing it with the purpose of lifting his name up? Am I doing it with the purpose of doing everything I do as unto the Lord? That's what matters. That's what matters. I don't walk around anymore going, oh, what's my purpose in life? My purpose is very clear. My purpose is to not live for myself anymore, but to live for the one that died for me. That's my purpose. And that's your purpose. That's the new purpose that Jesus offers you. I wonder sometimes with so many people, they're frustrated, they're angry, they're flat, they're all this stuff. And when you talk to them, their whole world is, everything that's going wrong is because they're so focused on themselves, living for themselves. I can't get enough of this and people don't respect me and I don't, this and And so much of it is because we're self-consumed. And if we would just flick that switch a little and go, you know, that doesn't matter. I'm not living for myself. I'm actually living for him. So what you think of me, it's not really that. I mean, you know, I hope you like me, but at the end of the day, my purpose is to glorify him. I'm living for something bigger than myself. My purpose is greater than myself. I had a man once say to me in this very, very congregation, he said to me, you know what, Alan, I know you talk about going hard after God and following Jesus, but I don't want to put Jesus ahead of my family. I understood what he was saying. But I said to him, let me tell you what I believe. If you put the life of God first and foremost... 
you will be a better husband to your wife than you'll ever be if you put her first. If you, if you put God first, you will be a better father to your kids than you could ever possibly hope to be if you put your kids first. If you put God first, you will be a better employee than you could ever be if you put your job first. If you put God first, you win because you get better at everything because you're living it for the right purpose now, for the purpose of glorifying God with your life. I might get the musos to come back. We're going to finish up. Uh, where's, yep, yep. So the resurrection, it reminds us that God is not just interested in managing who we are, but he wants to change us. He offers transformation and change. You've been, since last Easter, you've probably come to about 52 services. And I know what happens after a while. We kind of just get a bit, the world beats on the door, pressures come, things happen, and the life of God just gets kind of more and more subdued, doesn't it? More and more gently pushed to the back burner. That's not bad. We're not evil. We're not trying to. It's just life. It's just life. The importance of God can begin to wane a little bit. We can relax a little bit more there. We get a little more self-focused, maybe a little more focused on other things. For many of us, sometimes we return back to old habits and old ways of doing things. And every now and then it's good just for someone to come and shake the bucket up a little bit. You know, that's what I reckon Easter Sunday is. It's a shake the bucket moment for us. Jesus came to give us a new life. It's a good opportunity to stop and reflect and go, am I walking in that new life? Am I still embracing the new power? When I first came to Christ, I embraced the new power of God. I was telling, mate, I, I really felt close to God and I, everything I was doing, I was aware God was in the room with me. You might not have been there, but I knew God was. And it impacted what I watched on TV. It impacted what I listened to. It impacted what I said to my friends. It impacted what I did. It impacted where I went. It impacted everything. Because I knew his presence, his power was there. I knew that. But over time, that can wane. And I need my bucket shook to refocus. When I first got saved, I knew what my purpose was. I knew, good Lord, Jesus, you died for me. You died for me. What else is there to live for but you? My whole purpose is God. Everything I did, it was just, I just, want, I just want everyone to see that God is awesome when they see me. I want everyone to know that God can change even the darkest spot. The darkest night, he can turn it into something beautiful. I want them to see that in my life. No matter what I'm doing, if I'm surfing, if I'm talking with my mates, playing football. I remember when I got saved, the, the big fear of my uh, one, one Friday, every we'd play on Saturday and then that night we'd go to the Rouse Hotel in Ballina. And this particular Saturday night, I went out there and for this particular time, I just got saved. A mate of mine came up to me and wanted to buy me a, a beer and I, but that's not, not that I have a problem if you have a beer, whatever. But I said back then, I said, no, I don't want a beer, I'll have a Coke. And he laughed at me. He said, no, seriously, what do you want me to get? I said, no, I'll have a Coke. And he turned around and said, I'm not buying you that rubbish. And I lost a bit of a friendship over a drink of Coke. But the funniest thing that night was I had my coach and my captain come up to me while I'm sitting there with a mate talking. And they're just sort of hanging off my shoulders talking to me. And uh, I could tell that they were hanging around for a reason. They want to say something. And so I just turned to them and said, you know, what's going on? And one of them said, well... Look, I've got to ask you a question. I've heard that you're uh, 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 doing that Jesus thing. Is that right? And I said, well, yeah, I guess that's what you call it. Yeah, I'm doing that Jesus thing, you know. Because I was one of the better players on the side. So we hear you're doing the Jesus thing. I said, yep. And they said, well, look, we've just got to ask you a question. Does that mean you're still going to be able to tackle people? Because, you know, we can't. <laughs> well, isn't it funny? I said, you watch how well I tackle now. I've got Jesus. And pray for them when they get up. Resurrection, it reminds us that God doesn't just want to manage us. He wants to change us. But in order to truly embrace the resurrection life, there's two things we've got to do. Number one, we've got to believe for the new life. Amen? We've got to actually believe it. You've got to believe you have a new purpose and embrace it. You've got to believe you have a new power and embrace it. You've got to believe you have a new identity and embrace it. You need to believe you've been offered a new start and you need to take it and live it. The second thing is you've got to let go of the past. 
I don't care whether you're here this morning and you're thinking about coming to faith for the first time, whether you've been following Jesus for 50 years, there's relevance in what I'm saying for you. Because maybe you've dropped off a little bit in some of those areas and maybe you need to embrace again that new purpose. Maybe you need to embrace again the new power. Maybe you need to embrace the new start again and get up from here and go, you know, from here on forward, I'm going to embrace that new life that the resurrection reminds me Jesus came to give me. Amen? Amen. We're going to, we're going to have this uh, song here. I've asked uh, Daniel, would he play Amazing Grace? My favorite song. Um, for some of you, you like the old school version. Personally, I love that too. Uh, but we've got the new one, so we're... We're going to sing the newer one. But here's what I want to do. If you feel like the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you this morning, I, felt like, I feel like we want to pray for people this morning. And if that's you this morning, while we're singing, why don't you just come up out of your chair? Yes, you can sit there. Yes, you can do business with God. No, you don't need any. Yep, you can do all that. But can I encourage you that quite often what God's looking for is just that little step of faith. And God meets us in that place of faith as well. And getting up and coming forward, it's just a simple act of faith. It's your way of saying, God, that, that, that's me. And we want to pray with you this morning. We want to pray for that resurrection power to solidify some of those decisions, bring about some of those changes in your life. Because we've been offered a new life. Let's embrace that. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder of the resurrection, Lord, that... God, when we look at the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, it's not, just, it's not just something that happened to one man 2,000 years ago, but spiritually. Lord, it happened, it's happening to us as well in the sense that we are a part of that death, burial, and that resurrection into new life. I don't understand it all. I don't get it, but these ancient writers make the connection between us today, the audience that were listening, and what happened all those years ago. And Father, we want to embrace the new life that Jesus came to give us. So I just pray right now, Father, would you just not let anybody get up this morning and leave and not do business with you in whatever way, shape or form that is. Holy Spirit, change us and conform us into the image of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.